Hello and welcome back to another episode of A Cozy Christmas Podcast. My name is Art and happy Christmas Podcast Day, everyone. That's right. Uh, today is November 1st and all of us at the Christmas Podcast Network will be talking about our favorite adaptation of A Christmas Carol. So be sure to check out all the other podcasts at christmaspodcasts.com and find your favorite version. I'm pretty sure somebody's going to be talking about it today. Well, we finally have the cold weather I've been longing for. So I've made myself a cup of hot apple cider and I'm cozying up to the microphone today to talk to you about one of my favorite editions of A Christmas Carol. Join me today as I talk about A Christmas Carol on the stage. Now, A Christmas Carol might just be one of the most adapted pieces of literature ever written. It has hundreds of movie adaptations, and every year sees new ones added to the canon. Countless TV films have been made, to say nothing of how many TV shows have adapted the storyline. And on top of all that, it, it is being performed throughout the world on the stage by everything from the big, splashy productions like uh, The Old Vic in England, who this year, Doctor Who's Christopher Eccleston will be performing the role of Scrooge, which is one version I desperately want to see. But you'll also find small local productions done by community theaters or groups like that. Uh, there are those who do one-man performances. There's been radio editions, both old-time radio as well as modern-day adaptations. A Christmas Carol is even making its way into the podcast world. This fall, Hope Media Group is putting on a four-part adaptation of A Christmas Carol. They call it Scrooge. And it will star John Reese davies as the narrator and Sean Astin from Lord of the Rings fame is playing Ebenezer Scrooge, which I think is a kind of an interesting choice. It's not one that I would have thought of immediately as Scrooge. But I did listen to the trailer and he's, I mean, he sounds like Samwise Gamgee from Lord of the Rings. So I'm really curious how they're going to adapt this. And it looks like they're going to really emphasize the storylines of forgiveness and redemption in this story. And so I, I'm very curious how it's going to turn out. Some other names you might know is uh, Ben Barnes will be playing the Ghost of Christmas Past. Um, I recognize that name. It looks like some of what they're doing is to help with a, a, a ministry or a group called Compassion International. Uh, and you can find out I'll leave some show, uh, links in the show notes. I don't know much about them or one way or the other to um, recommend them or not, but uh, you can check that out on your own. But the trailer, I, I really enjoy the trailer. It put me right in a Christmas feeling. So that should be good um, and kind of a new way for me to experience a Christmas carol. And of course, if you are a diehard fan of a cozy Christmas podcast, you'll know that last year I recorded a Christmas Carol uh, on the podcast and released it in parts throughout December. I had so much fun doing that. I kind of think I might listen to it again this year. There are a few parts where I wish I, I would have done something different and uh, there's some editing issues in a couple of places, but I really enjoyed that experience of just sharing with you the joy of the story. All right, well, I'm off topic already. With so many good adaptations out there, it is really hard to decide which version to talk about today. But I decided I wanted to talk about the Carol as a stage performance. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the Gerald Dickens one man performance of A Christmas Carol, which I have seen maybe seven or eight times now. He comes to Omaha and he performs there, as well as many other locations around the United States during uh, November and December. And I'll leave all the information in the show notes if you are interested in hearing him. He is well worth listening to, not just his performance, but um, the stories he he, he tells during like question and answer time. Just the fact that he makes himself 
available to talk to the fans afterward and is willing to sign books and autographs and different things. Uh, it just makes the whole experience very worthwhile. And this is dangerously starting to sound like a, an advertisement, but it's not. This is truly one of my favorite ways to experience A Christmas Carol is, is on the stage. But to begin with, let's turn back the clock to 1843. A Christmas Carol was first published in December of 1843 and quickly became a beloved holiday tradition. Charles Dickens wrote this novella in a mere six weeks, and it really is hard to imagine a Christmas without it. I mean, whether I experience it through reading the book, which I do every year, or a stage performance, or one of my favorite film versions, if I didn't have this as a part of my Christmas celebration, something wouldn't feel right. Dickens had the idea to write something to help expose the, the suffering and the poverty of children, especially following a uh, February 1843 report called the Second Report of the Children's Employment Commission. And Dickens was completely heartbroken over what was exposed there. And he had planned to write a, uh, uh, some kind of political statement or pamphlet or, or article about uh, that he was going to call an appeal to the people of England on behalf of the poor man's child. And he came up with this other idea to write a story, one that would deliver a sledgehammer blow, he, he called it, that would come down with, uh, as he says in a letter, 20 times the force or 20,000 times the force that uh, would have been the impact of his of his article and that idea was to write a story a christmas story that would double as a way to um, also teach a lesson and so he combines all these ideas uh, including the idea of a ghost story which is something that victorians would commonly tell each other on christmas eve and what bubbled up into his mind is the story of A Christmas Carol. And so he began actually writing The Christmas Carol in October of 1843. And that's right, it comes out in December of that year, fully published. Let me read this quote from the Wikipedia entry about the carol. It says that uh, Michael Slater, Dickens' biographer, which, um, side note, great biography to read, describes the book as being written at a white heat. It was completed in six weeks, the final pages being written in early December. He built much of the work in his head while taking nighttime walks of 15 to 20 miles around London. Dickens's sister-in-law wrote how he wept and laughed and wept again and excited himself in a most extraordinary manner in composition. Slater says that A Christmas Carol was intended to open its readers' hearts towards those struggling to survive on the lower rungs of the economic ladder and to encourage practical benevolence but also to warn of the terrible danger to society created by the toleration of widespread ignorance and actual want among the poor well long story short he got the novel written um, he went to the publishers to try to help create this really beautiful well-made edition you know he, he wanted it to be everything he wanted everything to be perfect everything to be at the top of his game and he wanted to offer it at a price that anyone could afford. So consequently, the first run edition, he barely broke even because he paid for it out of his pocket uh, because his publishers were thinking, this isn't going to sell. But he was so passionate about it. And I think there's really no other story like this. So uh, to everyone who procrastinates assignments until the last minute, uh, you're in good company, okay? <laughs> Uh, it, it, there's proof that it can be effective. But uh, it was, again, immediately very popular. And since copyright laws at that time were virtually non-existent, um, stage adaptations started almost uh, immediately. So some years later, Dickens had the idea of raising money for charity that he would read a Christmas carol uh, to an audience and the money would go, like I said, to charity. He had such fun doing it and it and it it was such a 
roaring success that he continued to do it. Uh, Dickens enjoyed the fact that he was able to connect with his audience and almost immediate and, and, and virtually immediately be, you know, hear their reaction. And so his, his stage setup was very simple. He stood behind a desk that contained a pitcher for water. There is, I believe, like a candle or a lamp there in the text. He had an edited version that would take about an hour, hour and a half or so to read uh, from what uh, people have said. And I actually have a book that contains the script that he would use, um, which might be a fun thing to visit sometime in an upcoming episode. But uh, the Victorians were amazed at just his ability to be a public speaker, uh, the way that he became different characters. And uh, one of his daughters wrote a book about his, her memories of him after he had passed away and said that one day she recalls watching him writing in his in his study and he would write some things down and then run over to the mirror and make faces and say lines and different things and then go back and write. You know, that's something that I believe the movie The Man Who Invented Christmas, starring Dan Stevens, that they get that right. Um, that's what Dickens would do as he wrote. So he, he was an actor at heart. And what I discovered when I was reading A Christmas Carol last year uh, on the podcast is that it just it just lends itself to being performed. It was just it's so beautiful and it's so fun to perform it. But he enjoyed it so much that he began to tour with reciting uh, the, the Christmas Carol and, and different other selections from uh, from his own books. And some people thought that was kind of shameful of him, like having an author going out and promoting his own work. You know, he, he didn't care. He loved acting. He loved performing. And he loved his audience. Uh, you know, you could say he did it for the attention. That's probably, some of it is true, but he truly loved it. And there were a few times towards the end, uh, near the end of his life, where he was still touring, that he had to cancel because of health. And it truly broke his heart. So when you think about how A Christmas Carol is one of the most, if not the most, adapted piece of literature in all of history, it's fun to think about the fact that one of the first adapters of the novel was the creator himself. All right, so fast forward to today. And the tradition of live performances of A Christmas Carol is still alive and well. Some of my favorite one-man performances include Patrick Stewart of Star Trek fame. He has a recording that's brilliant to listen to. It is slightly adapted. It's not a full adaptation of the novel, but it's his on-stage performance, a one-man performance. But my favorite, hands down, has to be the performance by Gerald Dickens, who is the great-great-grandson of Charles Dickens. And today he's carrying on his, his grandfather's legacy by performing one-man shows of A Christmas Carol and other works by Dickens throughout uh, the United States and England. And, and really, he's had an opportunity to perform throughout the world. And much like his famous ancestor, Gerald Dickens performs A Christmas Carol as a one-man show. And his dedication to the craft and connection to the original author in bridging that gap to the audience makes his performances truly special. What I love about it is he really will more often than not let the text speak, you know, let the brilliance and the power of Dickens' language come out. He does add uh, throughout the performance a couple of, of uh, funny, funny asides and, and comments to the audience. And, you know, he, he just works very hard and very well at keeping us and keeping the audience engaged. At least in the performances I saw, Gerald keeps his set pretty uh, pretty sparse. He has a chair, a hat stand, and a blanket. You know, he's dressed up in a Victorian costume, and it really feels like Charles Dickens himself is there in, in the spirit by your elbow telling you this story that he loves so dearly. Some of my favorite parts that Gerald adds to it is when he, he'll recite something that doesn't quite make sense in our modern 
thoughts. Like near the beginning, he talks about how the spirit of Marley was like a, a lobster in a cellar, you know, that was glowing like a lobster in a bad cellar. And he kind of looks confused. Then he'll kind of, you know, break the fourth wall to the audience and be like, well, it's in the book, you know. And then uh, there's a couple other times where he, he breaks the fourth wall and kind of talks directly to the audience that are, are just really funny. Then there's the um, uh, some of the, his characterizations are so just he's a brilliant, not just a brilliant dramatic actor, but but he's a great comedy actor as well, um, especially his Mrs. Cratchit. You, you do not want to miss his performance of Mrs. Cratchit. It's hysterical. And uh, he really, really hams it up for the audience. And so it was an absolute highlight when during my first year of the podcast, I had the privilege of getting on a Zoom call and interviewing Gerald for uh, the podcast. So I'm going to go ahead and play a portion of that right now. I'll have the full episode linked in the show notes and really would encourage you to go and take a listen to it. Uh, but here he tell he'll introduce us to how he became involved performing a Christmas carol. And in fact, this year marks his 30th year of doing it. And so he's, so he's going to be celebrating a pretty major milestone in his life uh, this year. Gerald, why don't you uh, tell folks a little bit about yourself and how you got started in performing uh, the works of Dickens? Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, I've always been an actor since the age of nine. Um, I've always been involved in theatre and love being on stage. At that age, I was cast in a school nativity play as an oversized rooster. Um, <laughs> where we need another whole podcast to, to have time to tell that story. But, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> kind of the, 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 the bug bit. And uh, I, I, I just love being on stage. I loved performing. I love hearing an audience and, and feeling an audience respond to whatever um, we were trying to do. For a long time, I didn't have anything to do with the works of, of Charles Dickens. In fact, I, I, I purposely distanced myself from, from my great-great-grandfather. I, I, I didn't want to become um, purely involved in, in, in that circus, if you like, um, mm -hmm. because the image of Charles Dickens around the globe is still so massive. I know that there are a few modern celebrities who come close to to having the popularity he still has well over 200 years since his birth. So, so that's quite a, a thing to be drawn into. But then in 1993, which was the 150th anniversary of the first publication of A Christmas Carol, I was approached by uh, someone who was raising money for a, a small local charity who asked me to recreate one of the, the dramatic readings that Charles Dickens himself had given during the 1860s of, of A Christmas Carol to help raise money for her charity. And I didn't really want to do it. I, I was a bit reluctant and I, I, I sort of thought about it for a while, but because it was for charity, it was only ever going to be a one-off. I was only ever going to do it once. This yeah. is 93. <laughs> um, yeah. And I said, all right, I'll, 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 I'll do it. I'll, I'll give you a reading. Uh, I think she wanted two, two evenings and we'll take it from there. And she'd asked me in May of that year and, and come October, November, I'd completely forgotten that I'd agreed to do it until I got a phone call saying, you know, we're looking forward to your performance next week. Anything we can do for you? And I thought, oh, my word. Any <laughs> 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 preparation at all, I completely forgotten. Um, <laughs> so I, I went to my dad, and my dad was one of the biggest Dickens fans, but also Dickens experts. It's been my privilege to know, you know, um, mm. quite apart from being my dad and utterly supportive in anything I wanted to do. He knew all about Charles Dickens. So I went to him and said, look, I've been asked to do this. I can't do the whole book because that's going to take me four or five hours. Is there any script you know of that exists that, that is a nice sort of compact version of A Christmas Carol, but will tell the story in, in the sort of way that Charles Dickens did? And, and Dad said, yeah, of course I know a script like that. Um, it's the one Charles Dickens wrote. Um, that seems to be a good one to use. Yeah, what? yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what are you telling me? And he said, well, Dickens didn't just read his books he didn't just read passage from his books on the readings he created a fully um crafted script that worked as a piece of theater dickens was an actor he was a theater man um so use that and he just pulled it out of the bookshelf and said there we are use that so there was my script um 
And I started looking at it and I thought, well, it's Victorian, you know, <laughs> here we are in 1993 and things have moved on and people like drama and people like comedy and people like action, you know, people aren't going to sit for 90 minutes listening to a Victorian novel. So I, I, I need to kind of modernize it. I need to pump it up a bit. Um, well, why not use any talents I might have as an actor to, to bring these characters to life? So instead of just saying Scrooge did this, Marley did that, Cratchit did this, I will give them all characters. I will give them all voices. So I started looking at the, at the script. And the first description of Ebenezer Scrooge is that he was a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've got his voice then. That's, that's fine. Because <laughs> you, know, you, you just read that sentence and you can't help but, but become him. Um, so taking it from there, I took every character, using Scrooge's voice as the center, everything else had to um, work from that and be in contrast to that. So, so changes of, of, of character within a scene would be obvious. So Cratchit had a very soft, gentle, lilting voice. Um, and his movements are much more gentle as well to, to coincide, to, to contrast with the harsh voice of Scrooge and the very sharp movements and turns and looks. And, um, and, and I built it up over and over and over, which was, which was a fabulous thing. And as I went through, I thought, this is going to be quite special. I'm really proud of what I'm doing here. You know, I hadn't planned to do this, but this is turning into something pretty, pretty impressive. And I did this show. It was a reading then. I had a book in my hand and I was doing a reading, which meant all the gestures had to come from my right hand because right. I, I held the book in the left hand. And I started doing the show and the audience were obviously engaged and they were enjoying it. And I was thinking, this is fantastic. I, I, I'm reinventing the art of one man storytelling here I, 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 I'm changing the rules I'm a game changer and after the, the show the shows were done after that Christmas season I decided to read more about Dickens and his performing career and discovered that when he performed he gave all the characters individual voices and all expressions and ways of it. I, I'd invented absolutely nothing <laughs> I just recreated exactly what he had done um, 150 years before and and it gave me a whole new insight into the character of Charles Dickens. And I suddenly discovered the theatrical man. And, and that's where it all started. And from then on, I just couldn't get enough of it. And I, I've lived with this story for 27 years and I, I, I love it every season just as much. Yeah, yeah. Well, for having done it for so long, um, how, how do you keep it fresh? It changes all the time. It, yeah. It's always developing. Every season I do it, I will find a new angle on something and I don't go looking for it I don't think right this year I need to change the the tone of the show it's just during a tour um, which might be over two months and performing every day of the week and a couple of times most days you just find ways of saying something or a look or a way of moving that changes the whole emphasis of the scene and that can unlock things further down the line in the story well if he's thinking like that here then that's going to affect how he thinks in that later scene and that explains why he reacts like that in that final you know so it, it's sort of a living being if you like um it it, it it's constantly changing um and that's one of the most exciting things about doing it the book itself the story is so powerful yeah, um, yeah. i mean i've read it every year for like i don't know the last 20 years yeah. and i've seen movie versions i've uh, gone to a couple of uh theater performances i've seen mm -hmm. yours and it's still i mean i was watching the the video that we'll talk about here in a minute but uh and you know I, i'm tearing up at the end uh, it's just yeah. it's a yeah. powerful story <laughs> <laughs> it's and it's a great testament to the story that it works in all of those different formats mm -hmm. you know you, you can have a big special effect movie version of it. You can have a one man reading of it. You can have a radio show. You can have a television show. The Muppets can do it. Mr. Magoo can do it. And it always works. It always has the same profound effect on you. Yeah. It's an extraordinary story. And like I said, on the podcast, I, I talk about the story a lot and, and Dickens as, as often as I can get an excuse to. And, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, I was had a guest on, and we were talking about the story and and just marveling in the the beautiful you know redemption story that yeah. this book brings out too it's just yeah. so many themes that our world needs today one of yeah so right and and it, it's interesting if you scour the internet at the moment 
Mm. You will find so many streamed versions of A Christmas Carol, mm -hmm. um, either theatre productions or, or smaller productions or one man or whatever. And I think that's the reason. I think we need it. Mm -hmm. we, we need to be reminded that, that, that actually we're, we're, we're going to get through this as a society, as a community, and by cooperation and by caring and by, by just helping each other, by being there for each other. You know, that, that's how society needs to work. And, yeah. and, and that's, that's, that's a big, big message that we all need to keep being reminded of. Yeah. You know, a couple of years ago, I was reading it and there were some things happening in the news. And I read some, you know, I read up the passage about, uh, you know, ignorance and wants mm -hmm. the, the children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a lot of news about children and, and, and immigration and all that here yeah. in the States. And I just thought, man, we need to remember this. Ignorance <laughs> this, this and wants. Yeah, that's really where the whole story started from. That was that was Dickens's first um, inspiration for the book was mm -hmm. ignorance and want. Um, he was lecturing through that autumn and he was lecturing about the need to provide education for the children of workers who couldn't afford education for their children. Mm -hmm. Because what he was saying was that if we don't look after the next generation, we're sunk, you know. Yeah. So. We, we've got to provide. We, 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 we can't allow ignorance to grow through, through want of money and help and assistance. And he was making speeches and writing pamphlets about this issue. And he was making a speech in Manchester in October of 1843. And as, as he sat down, as he was listening to the applause, he suddenly thought, I can do so much more than just make a speech and write a pamphlet. If I can frame a Christmas book around this, but make it, you know, I, I don't want it to be a lecture. I want it to be entertaining and mm. and and um, readable. Then I can achieve so much more. And that's where it all started. October the 5th, I think it was 1843. He hadn't written a word. <laughs> By the 19th of December, it was on the bookstores. You know, incredible. Yeah, I don't know how many times I've, had to finish a project at the last minute. And then yeah. I, I, I hear these stories about, you know, these great works of art or literature yeah. or music are, were done last minute. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, no, nothing I ever did was. <laughs> just, just think if you had a whole year to work on it, it might not have been nearly as good, you know. It, right. It, it might have it. <laughs> this was just passion. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. He, he just caught, yeah. his, caught his passion and took off with it. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, and I, I think it's neat that he, you know, he's able to, you know, take these important themes. And like you said, instead of just lecturing, mm -hmm. it, it's put into a story that is a good story. Yeah. And entertaining and funny and heartfelt and, yeah. you know, kind of under the, the guise of let me tell you a story, but you're going to get a good lesson here too. It, yeah. It's, yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. And now that's, you, you switch off straight away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> whereas, whereas Dickens is clever. He gets the point across without you realizing right and you right. just feel better and you feel more kindly and you feel more more open toward helping your fellow man at the end of it yeah it always makes me laugh at my shows actually you know you see an audience coming in and they've been caught in traffic and the weather's bad and they haven't found a parking space and and you know they haven't got the seat they wanted and and <laughs> everybody's bad tempered you know and then when everybody's leaving there's just this atmosphere of of of, of fun and camaraderie yeah. and, and, and okay the, the story's worked its magic again <laughs> yes yes yeah I, I may have been one of those at one point so <laughs> <laughs> and then in this next section we talk about the video version he made back in 2020 and we continue to talk about more about the story and what it means to us just kind of interweave that conversation in with the, the DVD production. People have asked me over the years, over and over, am I ever going to put the, the show on DVD or am I ever going to film it? Mm. And the reason I never have up to now is I've not known how to. I, I Part of the, the joy of the show is the relationship between me and the audience. And, you know, you've seen it a few times. There's, there's a certain amount of back and forth and, and, and sort of cooperation. Yeah, audience participation, if you will, um, which is fun, and but but also the the, the darker scenes, the, the the tragic scenes. There is a connection, and I've always worried that if I just film the show, I'd, I'd lose that. But I thought, well, if, if if people want it, okay, we we can film it. I can do that. So I'll rent a theatre somewhere, 
I'll find a videographer and we'll film the show. And we'll do it two or three times. She can get different angles. Okay, be nice. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I was um, introduced to a, a young videographer and editor called Emily Walder, who, who's actually won an Oscar for her editing on a, on a, on a, a short movie she, she made a few years ago. And part of her work is filming stage productions. So I thought, okay, that's good. She'll, she'll be a good place to start. So I spoke to Emily um, and I said, you know, here's the show. And I, I sent her an old clip that somebody had just taken from a tripod camera at the back of a theater. And I said, you know, can we do this? And she said, yeah, it'll be fine. It's, it'll be easy. I'll, I'll come along. I'll have a camera on a tripod. We'll do a run of it. I've got a handheld camera so I can do some close-ups and track with you around the stage. You know, we, we can run through the show two or three times. We'll do it in a day. Mm -hmm. Easy. I said, okay, that's, that's good. Let's do that. And then I thought, well, you know, this is a good opportunity to do something a little bit more. So rather than just doing it on stage, why not start using different areas of the theater building? So it's still a theater-based thing, but we use blank walls backstage or we use the lobby or we use the bar or we use the auditorium itself and different scenes are cutting around. So, so, so suddenly it's becoming a little more vibrant. That's exciting, I thought, I'll, I'll do that. And then I thought, well, Maybe we can take a little bit further. Why not? Why not start trying to find a, a really spooky location? That's a spooky story. Marley yeah. was dead to begin with. First line. Ah, great. So let's film it in a cemetery. So I, I, I asked um, Highgate Cemetery in London, which is the biggest cemetery and gothic monstrosity of a place. It's incredible. Lots of very famous people buried there. And I asked them if we could film there, and and they said yes, that'd be fine, but we want a very big location fee I thought, okay well it's not going to work but it's got to be somewhere <laughs> <laughs> and then i thought well i know a very nice little churchyard in in the county of kent which is where charles dickens lived and it's the churchyard that inspired him to write the opening chapters of great expectations one of the most dramatic openings to a book there's little pip in this churchyard and a uh, convict leaps up from behind the tombstone and grabs him around the neck and so i said I'll, I'll, I'll use that. That'll be a good location. Well, if I do that, maybe there are a few other locations in and around that same area where Dickens lived that I can also use. So I went to the, um, the Rochester Council, Medway Council, who, who run that place, and say, would you mind me filming in a Christmas carol around there? And I, I have a good relationship with them. I, I, I perform for them a lot. And they said, yeah, we can do that. All of our venues are closed through lockdown. So as long as, you know, you're distancing and isolating and wearing masks and everything we can do that so i chose a number of locations that dickens had featured in other novels um mm -hmm. one is called eastgate house it's a wonderful old elizabethan house which featured in the pickwick papers and the mystery of edwin drood that or areas within that became scrooge's office his bedroom and the nephew's house um there's a little arms house in the center of rochester called the six four travelers house which dickens wrote about in a short essay which is very sparse and plain, which was perfect to become the Cratchit's house. And when we were filming there, the, 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 the custodian, the um, lady who owns it, said, well, would you be interested in using the correction room? I said, oh, beg your pardon. It's <laughs> <laughs> a bit alarming. And she took yeah. me down to the basement, where there's this dingy, dark sort of dungeon of a room. Oh, well, that was perfect for the the, the scene where the uh, the guy is selling on Scrooge's clothes and and yeah, yeah that, that, that turned perfect. And suddenly it all came together. So I started reworking the script. I, I took my my um, stage script, and I started writing it as a a movie script. Now I know nothing about filmmaking. I've <laughs> never made a film in my life, so I was just winging it. Yeah. As I went, we have a camera coming in there, and we could do that. And we have this coming in, and maybe a change of costume, and then that, and tracking shot here, and a swooping shot there, and. Mm. And I sent this new script to Emily. He said, yeah, here's the script. I'm, are we still okay for next week? <laughs> and I got a very polite email back saying, um, yeah, this has changed slightly to, to filming you twice through on a stage. I'm not entirely sure we can achieve what you want to achieve. You know, we're going to need a crew of about 500 and a budget of 100 million. And <laughs> time scale six months to do this. So, yeah. all right, we'll, we'll, we'll meet and we'll, we'll sort it out. And we started filming. The first time Emily and I actually met was the first day of filming. And she got it. She understood exactly what I was trying to do. And, and through, through her camera work and my performing and looking at what we had around us, looking at the scenes we had around us and how we could use them, 
the 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 film developed it grew into in, into something that we're really really proud of and which is really nice because that's exactly how the stage show grew as well um, mm -hmm. i never planned anything it just we did things that seemed right um and we filmed over about four days in the end and when we were all finished she took it all away and and did her editing stuff and i knew nothing about the film for three weeks i was terrified i had no idea what was going to come out the other end and then when she she sent it through to me and i i, I sat on my own and watched it and i was the same as you i, I was crying i was just crying at bits of it and, and laughing at other bits of it and oh wow you know, it was, it's been a really exciting few weeks at the, at the end of this year to to come up with the idea to source the locations to film it to see the edit to tweak it and, and then get it out there um yeah I'm, I'm so so pleased with with how it's gone yeah well, it, it's i mean it's beautiful beautifully shot the locations mm. especially that graveyard um, mm -hmm. were really powerful yeah and i thought it was quite a nice idea to, to to narrate it almost from the graveyard because yeah you know the, the 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 references to graves and tombstones and death and and come into the story over and over and over so yeah. to have that as our sort of go-to place was was a nice thing I thought it was pretty neat that the weather seemed to cooperate too when you needed it cloudy. Yeah. There was some cloudy. Oh great. Yeah. We were so lucky. We were so lucky. And uh, oh, the, the scene with the uh, ghost of Christmas present then when everything is sunny and, and the sun itself is out. And that was really neat. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no, we were, we were, you know, Charles was looking over us on that day. He was, I, uh, I think he so. He was putting two films up there to make sure everything worked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Well, and I know, you know, one of the things you love about doing theater and doing doing the play is that audience interaction and that that yeah. personal yeah. connection. And sometimes you lose that on film. But yeah. what, what I loved was how it still felt like it was very personal, yeah. whether it was, you know, you were addressing the camera. So, you, you know, you were talking to the audience as it were mm -hmm. um but then even just the the camera work you know, you're in that kind of point of view of following the narrator around and yeah. it does give you a little bit of a, a personal feel to it and and good i'm glad because yeah. that, that, that's what i wanted to capture um and that's one of the reasons we did a lot of narrative director camera and even even with a character suddenly turning to address the character as well mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, to address the camera as well um I'm glad you you picked up on that because I thought that was something I, I very much wanted to achieve. Yeah, I I thought that was that was a nice I don't know nice touch I guess that you know we I felt included in that like you would in a in a live performance. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good. I, I know nothing beats a live performance though, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that was that was really well done. So uh, I I love that. Uh, and uh, you know, and then watching it sometimes I'm usually, you know. We sit in the back or something we can't always see mm -hmm. as your face up as close and yeah you know and just, just to, to see you know some of the emotions that cross on your yeah. face and things that it, it it brought a new element to me a fresh element yeah. to me again um so that was the scene that, was that, that really got me watching it back was was the scene where bob cratchit just breaks down mm. when, when he's returned home and he's he's trying to be stoic he's trying to be brave and he's telling mrs cratchit that the graveside is beautiful and green and then he just loses it yeah and that's the sort of thing that you can capture so much more easily with the camera close to you rather than you sitting you know as you say sort of 100 feet away right. at the back of the, the, the back of the field club and suddenly you're, you're 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 in that scene and sharing it with him so yeah yeah, yeah that whole part where you know you you say the line uh you know show me some tenderness connected to the to death or, or mm -hmm. however that line goes and then mm -hmm. the next shot is is you just walking into that room where the cratchits mm -hmm. live and it's mm -hmm. it's like a gut punch you're like oh man yeah, yeah. because i know what's coming you, you know yeah, exactly <laughs> and uh for those who have seen or read the story you know what's coming and mm -hmm. it's like oh no not here um yeah. but i you know i think that's one of the most powerful moments in the story yeah. and i i think uh, I, I agree probably the one where, where Scrooge really is broken. You know, he realizes the good he can do and, mm. and the changes he can make. It's a very interesting point. And that's something that I've learned over the years about the story is what affects Scrooge, what, what gets him. 
Mm -hmm. And one of the most important things about telling the story effectively is the first moment that Scrooge is affected is the very first thing he sees with the ghost of Christmas past. It mm -hmm. has to begin then. Yeah. You see so many productions, not so much now, but you used to, in which Scrooge is mean and evil and nasty and he's mean and evil and nasty and is mean and evil and nasty. And then suddenly he gets terrified by the ghost of Christmas future and he's, he's you know, suddenly lovely. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. That, that, that makes no sense of the story. And I think one of the first moments is, I guess the reflection of seeing himself as a school child and remembering the loneliness. And then he compares that to the loneliness of the little boy who is Carol singing outside his door. Mm -hmm. And he sort of catches in his voice and he says, you know, I, I, I wish, I wish, and, and, and he can't finish the sentence. He, 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 the, the ghost pushes him and says, what's, what's the matter? And he said, well, there was a boy at my door singing a Christmas carol, and I just wish I'd given him something. And that's the first moment. That's when it all starts. Yeah. And then there's the, the, the scene with his fiancée, with Belle, which really breaks him. Mm. And each of these little moments just builds and builds and builds and builds until ignorance and want. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Well, hang on, you said that. <laughs> now what do you think? I know, I know. Um, and yeah, all, all of those moments are so important. It's so interesting, like you said. Uh, almost as soon as he's brought to the past and confronted with these things, I mean, he, yeah. he's he's starting to cry. He's yeah, you yeah know, when exactly. he see when he sees himself really as a boy. On. Yeah, really early on. It's, it's, it's funny. We I have an, um, an eight year old daughter, and we watched the Muppets Christmas Carol at the weekend. And it's the first time she's seen the story. It's the first time she she's known the story. And she watched it, and and the scene with the fiance is is what made the biggest impression on her. Mm. And she said, "Well, does does Scrooge get together with her? Does he get back with her?" And I said, "Well, no, because she marries somebody else, you know." And 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 Scrooge sees that, and and she's happy, and she's got a family of her own. And then again at the end, she said, "But doesn't he get to meet his the the the, the girl he loved?" Mm -hmm. Well, no, and that told me something that I've never realized before. That's the only point of the, the plot that isn't resolved. Yeah. Everything else is corrected by Scrooge's change. His relationship with his employee, mm -hmm. his, his relationship with his family, with Fred, which is the only link to his sister who he loved. The link, he saves Tiny Tim. But that heartbreaking moment, there's no resolution for that. It's gone. And, yeah. and that was a really interesting um, and very perceptive observation, which I, I've, I've never, mm. never picked up on before. I hadn't thought of that either. That's, no, no. that's, and that's, I mean, that's one thing I love about the story. I, I keep finding new things and yeah, exactly. people, people exactly. point out different things and this is great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you have a lot of challenges in adapting your, your stage performance to, to video or did it kind of not flow? Really. Um, not, not really. You know, I, I, I know the storytelling aspect works. Um, I know the edit works. If, if I were doing it again, I'd make it longer. I'd include more. I hadn't realized how much shorter, because I'm using the same script, funnily enough, mm -hmm. um, basically. And it's about 15 minutes shorter than the, the stage show. <laughs> uh, which, which is so, so, you know, I suppose movement or whatever. I, I don't know why that is. But um, so I'd love to take the opportunity to put some more passages in um, which I've never been able to have in in the in the stage show because of time constraints um, there are extra pieces I'd love to put in pieces of, of narrative language I love um, I think you said you, you'd read my blog this morning and I included that fantastic passage when when Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas present go flying across the oceans and out to lighthouses and down mines and that's an extraordinary piece of writing um, so so from that point of view, if I were looking at it again, I, I would try and expand it a little bit more. But um, no, the actual mm -hmm. challenges of, of creating it for a film, not, not too much. Um, now I know what we can do. Now I know what Emily can do as an editor and, and, and how we can film it. You know, yeah. I'd, 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 there are some scenes I'd love to, love to play about with a little bit. And, uh, but uh, yeah. no, it, it wasn't too difficult. 
Yeah. Well, I, I was really glad you left Mrs. Cratchit in. <laughs> oh, you've got to have Mrs. Cratchit in there, put in. <laughs> her, her pudding. Yes. We, we have lo loved that part so much uh, yeah. in your performance. And, and so now even at home, we'll, we'll start saying, supposing, supposing. supposing. <laughs> If, if we're worried about something. It... <laughs> That's an absolute genuine fear that oh, yeah. British um, mums would always have because the Christmas pudding, you steam for hours, you steam for about six hours mm. and you actually made it back in August. And, and since then it's been wrapped in cloth, um, sort of infusing, if you like, in a darkened room. So. And then you take the cloth out. You don't look at the pudding. You put that whole thing in a steamer and you leave that for six hours. The first time you know if this thing's worked is when you unwrap it to serve it. Mm -hmm. The last time you saw it was August. So, it, <laughs> you know, and, and, and this, is, this is the highlight of the, of the feast. This is, you know, the equivalent of pumpkin pie and Thanksgiving. It's, yeah. If, so if this doesn't work, the Christmas feast is ruined. And I remember <laughs> my mother getting terrified. And there was one year where it had... It, it, it hadn't worked. It had all collapsed. It had fallen to bits, and she was distraught. So, oh. so poor old Mrs. Cratchit's fears are, are, are completely genuine. But it's a lovely scene. It's a lovely yeah, scene. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably I, I don't know. Many people agree, but you know that whole scene with the Cratchit family is mm -hmm. uh, is my probably my favorite part mm -hmm. in the whole book. Um, yeah. Just so beautifully written. Yeah. Um, you know the the line about them being uh, poor, but they were happy with each other. I, I love that line. Um, it's happy with each other and with the season. Yeah. It's such a good reminder for me mm -hmm. every year. So yeah. <laughs> and again, if you want to get that full episode, the show will be linked in the, in the show notes. So I first experienced it. It was probably 2012 or 2013 or so, somewhere then. And my wife heard that he was coming to Omaha and just and asked if that was something I'd be interested in. And I almost died like right there. Like, yes, you know, actually having a chance to see a descendant of Charles Dickens perform this. I mean, Dickens is my favorite author. There's no way I'm going to meet him in person because... You know, because, you know, Dickens is dead to begin with. But to have a chance to see, you know, his great great grandson perform it, like, yeah, absolutely. And it was everything I could have hoped for and more. And so I've been able to go back just about every year. Now, if you would like to see him perform and he's not in your area, you can check out his website. I think it's GeraldDickens.com. If you can't, find a way to get to his performance he now has it on dvd he recorded it during uh, or the year after the pandemic i think um, in the dvd he actually films in places around england that have significance to dickens so it's a beautiful production and i am very glad to own it now um, and we'll certainly be watching it on those years that i'm not able to go and see his performance in fact this year I'm, it looks like I'm not going to be able to, which is unfortunate, but I'm, I'm glad that I have the DVD so I'll be able to still experience my, personally, my favorite performance of Scrooge. Um, the DVD is only $20. It's being sold through uh, Buyer's Choice, which is a, a company that makes caroler dolls, uh, like Christmas um, caroler dolls. And uh, I'll leave again the information in the show notes there you can check those out and like i said the dvd was only about twenty dollars unfortunately the shipping was almost doubled the price which it's kind of which kind of gave me a little bit of a pause but you know shipping is expensive and also for under forty dollars i mean that's how much the tickets cost uh possibly probably more than now and so I, when i looked at it from that perspective i thought okay this is this is worth it and then i'll i'll have it uh, I will always prefer to see him in person if I can, but if not, I've got the DVD as backup and it's, it's a beautiful production, like I said, and I'm so glad I own it. But in the end, it's not just the Dickens family that is involved in putting on adaptations of A Christmas Carol. It is a story that continues to inspire and touch the hearts of audiences worldwide. 
And so I encourage all of you to experience the magic of a Christmas carol in a live performance near you. I am willing to bet that most of you will have some kind of Christmas carol adaptation that is in a nearby town or city. And there's something truly special about being a part of a live audience and sharing in the joy and spirit of the season. Well, that will do it for this episode of A Cozy Christmas Podcast, uh, a special Christmas Podcast Day presentation. And so until next time, I want to... Uh, to remind you that uh, if you could leave a, a review or or share on your social medias, that really helps us out. And make sure to listen to all the other podcasts on the Christmas Podcast Network. There are plenty of podcasts that will suit whatever interest you might have. Again, today we're all talking about A Christmas Carol. I'm going to have so many <laughs> episodes to get through today. I can't wait. And I'm hoping to find some new versions If you'd like to help support the show in a financial way, there are links in the show notes. You can get some uh, Christmas t-shirts or uh, cozy Christmas merchandise. Um, Those will be posted there. And uh, I'm also on Ko-fi. So if you go to um, ko-fi.com backslash cozy Christmas for the price of a cup of coffee, you can help support the show. And I will send you a bookmark and sticker as my way of saying thank you. Just be sure to email me or message me your address so I can get that to you. You can reach out to me as always at cozy Christmas podcast at gmail.com. So with that, as we begin our official countdown to Christmas, I want to wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas. <laughs>